Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On February 12, 1988, an event occurred in the Black Sea between two Soviet frigates and the cruiser Yorktown and the destroyer USS Karen. This was known as the Black Sea Bumping Incident, something that was controversial during the waning years of the Cold War. Speaking of controversies, something occurred about a month earlier that ultimately led to this week's guest piquing his interest to the rules of the NFL. You may have heard of it. The moment is simply referred to as the fumble. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is January 17th, 1988 in Mile High Stadium to witness a moment in NFL history (laughs) labeled as one of the worst plays, even in an NFL Films documentary, of a rundown of the top 10 worst plays in NFL history. But that would lead to something for this week's guest. His name is Ben Ostro. Ben is the founder of FootballZebras.com, and according to their site, Football Zebras celebrates the 33rd NFL team, the officiating crews. As we get closer to the NFL's 100th birthday next week, it's important to remember just how much of an impact the officials have had on the game, not just the bad calls that we all remember. And speaking of Ben, he is also a published author. His book is called, So You Think You Know Football, An Armchair Ref's Guide to the Official Rules. And speaking of the book, Ben's going to go ahead and autograph a copy and send it to one lucky winner. If you want to enter into this contest, you can head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. Now, this giveaway does end on Sunday night, right before first Sunday night football game of the 2020 season. So you got to go on right before you watch it because you don't want to forget about it. Make sure you sign up. Well, better yet, sign up right now. Again, you go over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. And even if this episode, you listen to it past the contest, past Sunday night, you can always go back to that same page because we always have different kind of giveaways, almost weekly type of giveaways of autographed books and other things. So go over there to that website. We'll take a look at it. Maybe get yourself signed up for something. But for now, let's go ahead and learn about the NFL's 33rd team with Ben Ostro. It'll be like kind of faded in. And I mean, one of the first things I really wanted to ask you is, like, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, why did you even create footballzebras.com to begin with? Well, it was one of those things where you see a call on the field and everybody's an expert on the rules up, down, and sideways. Uh, you ask anybody in, 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 a, in a bar full of people, uh, you get like all these different opinions about it. But I wanted to get in a specific instance where a call was made uh, and it was actually an inadvertent whistle. And happened to one of the one of the best referees that they had at the time, Ed Hockley. And I said, you know, did they really get out of that? Yes, the, the whistle was wrong, but did they get out of it the right way according to the rules? And so I saw all the opinions on one side and the other, all with the team bias. And I said, you know, there should be something out there that gives me the answer to my question without all the, the team bias and all that. So trying to Google around, I couldn't find it. So eventually I just created it and said, you know, I know what I'm talking about. I've had a rule book. Uh, I started uh, 
becoming really interested in, in the nitty gritty of the rules. I wrote to the league in 1987 and I said, you know, can we, can you send me a rule book? They said, send us five bucks. Of course, the opportunists that they are. And, uh, they sent me uh, the actual rule book, the same one that the officials got. And, you know, year after year, I'd mark in all the changes and all that. And then I'd get an updated one a couple of years later. Um, so I, I kept up with that through the years and just kind of created this as my own thing, just kind of doing it out there. And we kind of picked up some followers after uh, the lockout uh, in, in 2012. And, you know, a lot of a lot of interest on the, the scrutiny of the calls then. So, you know, we're very busy and uh, it just grew from there. So you kind of created that that source that you were looking for. You just said, oh, it's not out there. I'm going to create it myself. Yeah, it's just the way it kind of came about. I, I said, if it's not out there, I'll just kind of write about it. Just as a little side hobby, nothing nothing much. And, you know, nothing that, that maybe 10 people might pay attention to in, <laughs> in a day. Uh, but it certainly has gone from there. Right. Yeah. And that was going to be one of the questions was, did you start this thinking uh, to turn it into what it is today? Because it's it's fairly large. Or did you start it as a side project? No, it was just supposed to be a side project, just kind of having fun, throwing things out there. And, and after a while, I found other people that were more passionate or just as passionate, but more passionate than the common fan about officiating and the rules. Uh, I added my my partner Mark Schultz. He's the assistant editor now, and he he's an official at the high school level. So he gave a whole new dimension. I was I was a rule book guy. He gave me the here's what it's like on the field. Here's what it's like to unpile a, a, a fumble scrum. Here's all of, uh, of all the ins and outs. And we just really started to hit our stride at that point, covering all aspects from officiating mechanics and philosophies. And, and of course, covering all the rules. Yeah, I mean, I was looking through the website and you have a lot of different types of content on there and, and offerings for anybody that's interested. Could you maybe talk to some of those offerings that you have on there? Well, one of the things I want to make sure is we are more in the educational area. We're going to take a play. We're going to pull it apart. And we're going to step you through. We're not going to just say, here's the rule. That's what it is. And we're going to say, well, here's how the uh, rule evolved. It started with this, and this is why you see it now. Now, maybe it's it because we've seen this in this particular situation. It doesn't fit anymore. So, okay, well, that, that might be something for another rule change. You know, you make all these patches all, along the way, change something here, change something there. Then this unintended consequence, which they rake over all this stuff anytime they, they go through a new rule. The competition committee looks at everything. But you know that there's just going to be something that you'd never have seen before. And so we just kind of take that and, and parse it out step by step. Well, this happened, so this happened. So this this meant that they had to treat it this way. And, you know, not to not to come across uh, as, as giving, you know, uh, a plus or minus on officials, because for the most part, the 98 percent accurate. So we're really not grading officials. And to be fair, we should be really, if we're going to grade them, we should be marking them on every play, even a false start. Uh, you know, we just don't have the time to be going through every single play, every single snap and non-snap just to check all of this. Uh, so we get the big plays, the ones that everybody sees. And, and we, we mention, you know, okay, this is a touchdown. This can't be a touchdown. This is loss of control at this particular point. So you have to spot it here. And and then my favorite one that always comes up is a fumble through the end zone is a touchback and a turnover to the other team. And it will be that I will die on that hill. That rule will stay uh, as long as as I can advocate for it. But a lot of uh, strong opinions on that particular one, for sure. Yeah, and there's been a lot of real changes throughout history, and we've talked about many of them on this show that um, a controversial play on the field just totally changes the direction sometimes even how how the game is played and one for me that we talk about hit home the Kelvin Johnson rule what about that one were you were you live during that time yeah that was roughly when we were getting going and you know we were we were right on that and we said you know hey you know it doesn't look good 
but it is the rule and it's in there. And we explain the reason as to why that was in there. Had that been in the field of play, that would have been ruled a fumble. Do you want that? Uh, you know, that that's one of the things that, that we added into it. And so, you know, not that we're towing the line of, of the competition committee, but we're saying this is, this is the rule as it is, you know, I mean, if you're going to change it, what is it going to become? And, you know, after, over the course of time, you know, as, as we became a little more and more frustrated with the catch rule, uh, we wound up, uh, you know, they, they did pull that out a little bit. And so we talked with officials and tried to figure out, well, how does this affect everything? How are you going to um, officiate this? And, and it was more, we're going to use our officiating sense on what a catch is. And we're going to call it that way. You can write down five paragraphs that says, when this foot steps and this happens and this turn upfield, we're going to make that judgment in real time. And that's going to be it. And it's, that's why we're paid to be there to make those judgment calls. So what we wound up doing is we added a whole bunch of verbiage to the rule book. And a lot of it had to do with replay because you had to be able to make that judgment call based on some objective criteria in the rule book when you are now slowing it down to the, you know, one frame, you know, uh, and just parsing it down at the frame level as to figure out when the catch uh, process ends and when you know when you're going to deem it to be a fumble from that point forward um and again it, it was you, you add patches and then you you wind up with these unintended consequences they took it out and it went back to you know old school 1950s definition and and it's worked and yes you're going to have the controversies you're going to have them uh you know but now it's going to be the other way it's going to be not uh that we ruled against the fumble, but we're going to give a catch and a fumble uh, when they uh, when they probably should not have. So I, I think it was a good change and and over time. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was one of those things that, you know, you, you had all these dueling uh, aspects to it and it, it took a while for them to, to be comfortable with it and just to leave it in the official's hands. Same thing with the tuck rule. They just took it out. When are you going to say it's a fumble? Well, it's a fumble when it looks like a fumble. Okay, that works for me. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, of course, I, I do not envy the calls that the officials have to make on the field, especially with the real time, how fast the game is, and thinking about like how much money even when you break it down could be changing hands and things like that. It's just crazy. Um, some of the scrutiny that they get, it's like, Hey, they're human. Everything's human. But like you said, 98% of the time or whatever the number is, they're going to be accurate. And you mentioned something about how we changed the rule. Um, did you, were you speaking as far as you were involved with the NFL in any capacity or was that just a general uh, statement? No, I, I, when we, uh, go through our rules, you know, we're, we're going to obviously state it as the competition committee had worked on. It and then, you know, when they make public statements on that, we, you know, we're aware of that. And so we kind of frame our, our analysis and say, look, this is, this is how the competition committee has uh, seen this uh, to work. One time I, I did throw in uh, a, a rule suggestion uh, to Al Riveron uh, maybe it got kicked around in the committee. I don't know, but uh, basically, it was to to treat all uh, uh, illegal forward passes the same. Some are loss of down. Uh, some of them are from the spot uh, of the of the pass. Um, so we we found a couple of cases where uh, where a quarterback dumped off a second pass, batted back to him, threw it a second time to avoid a sack. And I said, well, you know you could have hit him for grounding and you would have had it at the spot. So we said, you know, maybe it'd be best to have this equitable. So, um, you know, they have a lot of other things to consider. So I don't know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll show up in a, in a year or two. Who knows? <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a lot that's going on. And that reminds me too, of playing fantasy football and they always come out with the stat changes and like, I don't know, Thursdays or Tuesdays. I'm not sure what day it was, but it typically normally doesn't affect the fantasy outcomes because it is normally defensive, you know, things or one or two yards. But one time it was a Ben Roethlisberger. And instead of a, I want to say, instead of 
a lateral pass that gave him the forward pass or vice versa. So then he ended, it ended up winning a lot of different people and losing a lot of people. It's like, I don't know if it was a championship or it was like a very highly competitive games, you know, playoff time. Well, there was a time, uh, it was, um, uh, uh, it must've been about 10 or 12 years ago. We noticed something where, uh, a first down was granted in error, uh, on a nine yard run. um, and what wound up happening is that did have fantasy implications because the statistician had to add the yard to to count it as a first down. And I don't remember who the who the running back was at that time, but they didn't have 99 yards. They had 100 yards. So, yeah, <laughs> there, there can be some fantasy implications. I mean, that never enters the head of the of the official. Oh, but, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah there, there can be many, many uh, implications that way. So how, I mean, so the statisticians, that's got to be such a challenging role too. Like they, they can do it so quick and they put, they put all these numbers up on the screens and do you ever really talk to anybody that's involved in that? We touch on it a little bit uh, because it, it does have some interest. Uh, we also wound up partnering up with uh, a website called quirkyresearch.com. Uh, and they are getting into a lot of the, well, when these obscure things happen, I said, you know, that that's a lot of overlap in what we do. Uh, so we teamed up and, and it's been an excellent partnership between the two of us. We've, we've put things on, on uh, both sites. Uh, so it, it's been, it's been a, a good road for now. This is the third year that we've been together. Um, but yeah, some of those, some of those questions do come in on Twitter uh, you know, how can, how can you do that? And that, uh, how is that ruled, uh, fantasy wise? And I'm like, Hey, I got a guy for you right over here. So that, that works out. We, we try not to get too much into the statistical questions, but again, they are basing a lot of their, uh, judgment calls on the actual rules. And, you know, the, the statisticians manual has all sorts of things as far as, you know, when you call it a backward pass and when you call it a, you know, a forward pass and it's all based on the rules. Yeah. I mean, speaking, you talked about like the, the rules and things and how they have changed. I mean, of course the, well, I shouldn't say of course, but we've talked about this on the show. The NFL used the collegiate rules for so long till what was it, the thirties or forties or something like that is when they decided to... they started their own rule book. Um, they had about five or six changes from, from the college book, but uh, yeah, and that was one of the things that I started to do to try and get into the history is to pull off, you know, on eBay, there would be various rule books out there and, and some of the college rule books from the 1920s uh, were, you know, they were essentially the de facto NFL rule book. Uh, and then occasionally they'd have a few ground rules that would, would differ. Uh, but for the most part, you know, they, they would follow that. And then, you know, that there would be a committee that would meet every year and it was just college conferences that would meet and they were outsiders. And so the NFL saw changes that were being made and say, hey, you know what, we, we'd rather not make that change. We're going to kind of split off on our own. And that's when they created the rules committee, which was uh, headed up by by George Hallis, I believe, at the, at the very beginning moved along and and then eventually in the 19 1967 it became the competition committee and do you have much on your website going way back to like the the beginning of football and water camp and the other stuff like that or is it more in the nfl time frame yeah we we stuck to mostly the um NFL time frame, although we we did touch into a lot of those especially when we were discussing the um uh, you know, the, the 100th anniversary of the NFL, we were going back to, to some of those early days and, uh, you know, things like how the, uh, originally uh, the, the coin toss was just handled by the, the two captains and then they just told the referee who won the toss. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think that's going to work out too well, particularly if you have Jerome Bettis out there. But uh, Right, right. <laughs> And and we did a whole post on on the history of the coin toss, which you think it's just such a mundane exercise, but there's like all of these little quirky things that have popped up in the 1962 uh, AFL championship. You know, the one that went into double overtime. You had Abner Haynes say, "Oh, you know, they won the toss," and they said, "We'll kick to the clock." He went by Hank Stram's instructions. 
we'll kick to the clock. The official heard, we'll kick. And he says, that's what you're going to do. And so now, instead of choosing field position, they wound up kicking and losing out on the field position. Um, but then, of course, when it went into double overtime, it was really uh, not, of no consequence. But, you know, we've seen them bounce off helmets. We've seen them land in the snow on its side. We've seen them go up in the air and, and not flip. Uh, you know, all sorts of, of different things. And, and then, of course, the notorious one, which we, every Thanksgiving, we run our public service announcement that Phil Luckett, the referee that day, he was right in what he said. Uh, you, you go back and, and you watch the video and Jerome Bettis even admitted to Cower, to Bill Cower on the sidelines. He says, I said, huh, tails. Well, you know, you, you can't, you can't do half of that, you know, he, so he was right to, to call that that way. And, uh, you know, for generations, uh, it would be Phil Luckett's name that goes down in ignominy because of what they've perceived to be the botch when it was really called right, right there on the field. I don't know what NFL is worth billions of dollars. Why don't they have a coin with like each team on the other sides? Well, that's one of the things when you have uh, some of these um, uh, neutral site games, like the college bowl games, you know, they'll just have a two sided coin and, and it's, you know, nobody calls it. We're just going to flip it. And, and that's the team that gets the option. So, you know, maybe, you know, you see the NFL start to move into these 17 game schedules in the future you know, maybe they'll throw in neutral site games here and there. And, you know, maybe you won't have a, a a coin toss that's called by one team or the other. It just would be a two-sided coin that determines which team gets it. it they did it in the draft for, for many years um, where they would have a, a two-sided coin. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that the rule change came by that, to get rid of that. But, uh, yeah, that would be that would be kind of interesting to see that on an NFL field, I would think. Yeah, it seems like it'd be pretty easy. Um, you know, you make all the coins during the, you maybe even sell the coin if you want, so you can make the money back. I don't know, but it's like it doesn't cost that much. You're worth billions of dollars, but uh, I guess never that's besides the never miss an opportunity to make a buck. They they will find a way to monetize that. That's for oh, sure. that is for sure. They definitely yes, they treat it like a business, like nobody's business. And uh, speaking of treating it like a business, and a lot of times making rule changes because of treating it like a business and knowing fans will come in. I mean, can we talk to maybe some of the, I don't know, go through the decades, some of the most important rule changes and what a little bit of history is from them. Well, I'm always asked, what's, what's the biggest rule change you've ever seen? And it has to be replay for me. Just admitting that, Hey, you know what? We're going to take a second look after the play is over is just, I mean, that, that is a major shift. And now, uh, you know, we were talking with um, Fred Goodelli, the, the producer of, of Sunday Night Football on NBC. He says, it used to be a game of inches. He says, now it's a game of frames. We're parsing this stuff down at the, you know, at the frame level. And, you know, it's amazing to see how many times they get that call right in real time. And then when you see a replay, most of the time, it's okay. You know, either the, the official was screened or whatever it is. There's very rarely something where they just really drop the ball on the call. I mean, it happens, but it's very, very infrequent. Usually you have situations, particularly when you're dealing with a sideline, you got one that's looking at feet, one that's looking at the ball. And depending on which way the, the play is going, they know which one has that responsibility. And, you know, so, and, now you add a fumble into it and now bodies are flying everywhere and they catch that or they catch that that player touched the ball and his foot was on the sideline. I mean, some of these, some of these, I don't see them in the real time. And then I see the replay and I'm like, you know what? They got it right. And and that's one of the things that I found from replays, you know, it's, it's affirming a lot of the calls and, and the statistics bear that out over time. Um, you know, you're throwing things into replay and, you know, they're just coming out that, that they're not, they don't have enough to, to change the call. And in, in many cases, we, you know, we also look at it and occasionally it's, it's in the language of the announcement. 
uh, you know, it's either confirmed, reversed, or stands. So stands is like we don't have enough to, to overturn it. But confirmed on a coach's challenge is like a dagger to that coach because he's like, he just burned the challenge for no reason because they found that the officials were absolutely right. There wasn't even any gray area on that. So that that's one of the big changes. I mean, you, you see all sorts of things, particularly in the 70s, where you know they made a lot of changes to open up the offense, um, even, even starting in the 50s. But in the 70s, it wound up being more pass-oriented rule changes. Um, you know, 1960s, you, you have a holding penalty in the backfield, you, and, and it's a sack. Um, you get marched back 15 yards from the point of the sack. So now you're up on a, you know, you were first and 10. Now you're second and half a mile. I mean, it's, it was one of those things where they said, you know, we're going to cap it at 10 and, and do it that way. Or, you know, or you accept the play and then it's second and the spot of the sack. Um, but yeah, you would, you would wind up with second and, and, and 32. And, you know, where are you going to go? You might as well punt on second down at that point. Um, so a lot of these onerous rules started getting, you know, uh, uh, penalties started getting dialed back, favoring the offense. And then you see the laments that, you know, well, it's hard to play defense out there because the rules favor the offense. Yes, they do. Because the, the overwhelming uh, uh, opinion is that, you know, offense means more points. More points means more interest in the game. So they're going to favor the offense with the rules. They're going to make a rule change. They're going to look at how that impacts that, that, that offense. They're also going to look at how it impacts the time of game because time of game means money, commercial time and, and all that. So, you know, those, those are the two overwhelming factors that come into play. You also add in player safety, which is of course, one of the things that has uh, taken extra scrutiny over the last uh, 10, 15 years particularly with head hits and, and things of that nature. So, you know, th th that's where you're, you're seeing the game moving over the course of time, promoting more offensive output. And, you know, defenses be damned, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> they can they can thank uh, the NFL's Mr. Einstein, Shorty Ray, for that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned how you're just amazed, and I don't know if I can use the right word either, with how they can – real time make the call did you ever talk to officials and like ask them you know how long does it take to i'm using air quotes here get it you know like how many hours or years or whatever before they're like yep okay it's like i can see it in slow motion now yeah well every official is going to go through a process they're going to start at at the jv level they're going to start officiating high school games you know you're not going to walk into uh into you know the the uh, any of the Power Five conferences without working your way up there. Now within the Power Five, you know they they have their tentacles down into Division Two and Division Three, and they're sharing a lot of the resources. So they're aware of people that are bubbling up in those lower levels. They start to move up. Ones that are better move up quicker than others. You really need to see somebody, and and it's even. I'll even say people who work the chains on the sideline, you work a high school game and then you work a, a even a division two game, you got to move much faster than you do for that high school game. So if it's, if it's a task on the, uh, on the chain crew, then it is definitely on the officials and that speed just increases and increases. So then you get to the, to that power five level or, or, or in, in the bowl, group there and you know you need to have somebody there for at least five years to really nail everything down get the speed of the game get in the right place at the right time and all that and then when you get to the nfl they even say that there's a five-year learning curve when you're to the nfl i mean you're not you're not gonna botch anything major uh you're you know your stuff um you know and, and mistakes will happen but that's why Super Bowl officials have to have at least five years of seniority and a playoff game, uh, a top playoff game, usually a conference championship game, under their belt. You can't just walk right in and, and start getting all the, the good assignments. 
you got to work your way up. And now the officiating department's taken on more of a, of a developmental role, recognizing that, hey, we've, we've hired a bunch of officials. About 25% of our staff is, is within that five-year span. We need to be developing. If they're, if they're still learning, if it's just the same as, as a toddler and how their brain forms over their first five years, and the same thing is with officiating that they develop over a five-year span to the pro level, we need to be working with them, developing them as we go along. And so now they're putting more resources into that, recognizing that because, you know, you, you, the, the lament sometimes is from uh, from fans is like, oh, the officials are too old. Well, you know, but they're experienced. And yes, you know, the, the, the tire tread does wear thin and, you know, they, they lose some steam and all that. And you do have to replace them over time, but you can't, you have to have that mix. You have to have a twenty-five year old, a twenty-five year veteran on the field with with a one year, two year guy. It's that balance, and as long as you can talk with each other, and the twenty-five year veteran doesn't pull rank on the two year guy, you know you're you're on a good crew, and you can work together, and 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 that's what what works best. But you know it it is still a challenge to get up to that speed even when you do get to the NFL, even when you're deemed to be the best, one of the best at your position, you still have more improvement to go. Yeah, I would imagine so. Just like a player, they might have been the best in high school. You go to college, you're like, whoa, okay, maybe I'm not. Then you get to the pros, you're like, I'm one of many before I came, and now I am not the guy I used to be compared to everybody else. And you kind of alluded to NFL fans. Uh, What do you think is maybe the biggest misconception that fans have of officials that officials are part-time because while that may be the pay structure, they put in full-time work every week. It's not the three hours of the game. They're already working the game two hours before the game. They're already, you know, they're in the, in the warm up period and they're, they're monitoring things. They're taking down numbers of, uh, you know, the umpire has to keep track of who's got a hard cast on, you know, all, all these various things uh, that have to be done before the game. I mean, and then that's just the game day. The week after a game, there's all that preparation, looking back at what you did, looking at, at specific key plays as to where things were, you know, checking over, if, if, you know, if it was close or if it was uh a markdown, you know, you're going to look at that. You're going to remember that and you'll make sure that you don't make that mistake again. They go over that individually. They go over it with, as a crew. And they have all these meetings, discussions during the week. They have training tapes that they go over. You got to pick up the rule book every once in a while and thumb through. You see something that happened. And you say, well, you know, they interpreted it this way. But, you know, maybe there's maybe there's another valid interpretation or maybe we've we've got something where we have an overlap. So uh, you got rules tests, you got all that before you've added all that up, um, and not to mention the fact that you got to keep yourself physically fit during the week too. Um, so you add in all that film study and and rules tests and and you know just discussion with other officials. You've got forty hours of work right there, in including so. If you write a book, and I think it was it was the the late Jerry Seaman who was the uh, the head of officiating in the nineties. Uh, he said, if you were going to write a book about prep, preparing for a game or for officiating, he said every chapter would be about preparing for the game, and the last chapter would be the actual game. So there's just so much that goes into preparing and and you know just making sure that you have all that stuff down cold reviewing all these various film uh, uh, clips and, and things that came up on other crews and your crew and, and how you discussed it. And maybe there was a better uh, way that to handle this more expeditiously, you know, all, all sorts of factors that, that come into play. So the officials do put in full-time work. They just don't get the credit in the public for, for doing that, that full-time work. I feel like you kind of have a uh, 
personal passion for understanding the uh, struggles that the officials go through. And uh, you've been in it for, geez, I don't know, is it fair to say a little bit over 10 years now since the website's been up? Yeah, we're going to be in our 12th season this year. Okay, so we'll call it 12 seasons that you've been up as far as the website. So you've been knee deep in this. Do you find yourself watching the games differently now than you did 10 years ago? Yeah, well, you're you're looking at at where the play is going. You're not a ball watcher all the time. Uh, you know, mo- the most of the fans are just watching where the ball is and not where it's going. And, you know, or also watching what happens in the aftermath. You know, um, one of the criticisms that was levied against uh, the crew in the NFC championship game a couple of years ago with the missed pass interference and there was a lot of criticism that was warranted, but there was a lot that was not warranted, such as why did the referee not jump in? Well, he's got to watch the quarterback because that, when that play ends, his responsibility to the quarterback, once that ball has been released, he still has to watch that quarterback to make sure he's not getting any cheap shot or anything of, of that nature. Then you can transition downfield, but by that time, you know, that that's – trying to focus in on an object that's 20 yards away, um, you know, and, and, and moving and trying to make sense of that. Um, you know, that, that's what I said is it, it's trying to uh, be the witness of an accident, but you were a block away. Well, what could you really have seen from that? Um, and, and that's one of the things, I mean, you know, yeah, there was a big, it was a big breakdown. Um, there were multiple factors that, that we looked at for, for that particular thing. And, and see, that's the other thing is that, you know, an official's a career is not going to be made up of, oh, hey, we did this. Officials don't win games. They don't come out with a victory or anything. I mean, yeah, they have a good sense that they call a good game, but it's not like, you know, you won the game or anything like that. But if you miss a call, boy, that that sticks with you for a long time. And you'll remember that. And, you know, some of the really you know, the really tough ones, uh, you know, and in those tight situations in big games, you know, they'll, they'll stay with you for the, for your career. But the thing is, is, is the ones that shrink from that, those are the ones that don't succeed. The ones that take that and say, this is going to build me into a better official. I'm going to be more aware of, of these things. So yes, it does disadvantage the saints in that particular situation. And I get that. And I know that it was, you know, all of the, uh, the passion behind that. Um, it's a game offic- played by humans, officiated by humans. And, you know, we, uh, the alternative would be that we would just watch video games every Sunday. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, just burying your nose in the rule book, you're only going to get certain things. You know, just watching a team, you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to have a, a thing. Uh, that that really has any empathy towards what the officials go to through, but just talking over the years, you know, and just understanding what it takes to do this. Could I run out on the field and, and take it? No, I'm not. I'm not even com- putting myself anywhere near them and saying that I could even jump out and, and, and do what they do. Um, so, you know, that that's one of the things is I've just always had an appreciation for what they do and how they do it. And, you know, nearly flawlessly to the point where when something goes wrong, it's like, oh, my gosh, something went wrong. It's it's an anomaly, not not something that happens too often. Yeah, unfortunately, though, you did bring it up uh, as fans. We typically we remember the bad calls. We don't remember the thousands and thousands of perfect calls that they made. I mean, we either as regular fans, we rec- we remember at Hercules or we remember the bad play, that, the bad call that he made, that kind of thing. But great referee all throughout. And speaking of great referees and, and officials, uh, how many of them are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? <laughs> well, funny you would say that. That that's been one of our um, one of our, our causes that we've taken up. You look at um, like the basketball and hockey Hall of Fames; they have sixteen uh, uh, officials in there. Uh, in Cooperstown, there's there's ten umpires, uh, but there's there's zero in Canton, and it's just like a major oversight that that we think 
you know, it's long overdue to correct that. Um, we, you know, that there's one individual that's in there that worked with officials. He was a college official. Um, his name was Shorty Ray. He was part of developing the, uh, the league when it just started to bring in officials as crews. They used to be uh, back in the 20s and 30s. You know, a team would just hire somebody from, you know, maybe from the college or, you know, maybe it's a local athletic director. You know, can you work a game for it? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then it started to become a little more centralized. And by 1938, you had the league creating crews and assigned positions. So now that's that's where the modern form of officiating takes place. And so then you have a technical advisor, and it was Shorty Ray that came in, and he he would advise the commissioner on rules uh, matters. The commissioner still communicated with the teams on, you know, whether it was a rules dispute, it was the commissioner's job to handle that. Um, so he wasn't one that supervised the officials. He just worked with them. So he did make it in the Hall of Fame, very deserved and, and was very instrumental on rules changes in the 40s and 50s and, and officiating mechanics. He was a big part of that. But he never worked an NFL game um, and he never supervised officials. Then uh, a few years after him, you have um, Art McNally. He joins the NFL in 1959 as a field judge, works his way up to referee. They're starting to move into the uh, into the uh, the merger with the AFL. And now they have like a couple of out of work uh, coaches that are the heads of officiating. So they said, you know, let's get somebody in there who's an official. So he gets there in 1968. Runs it right through 1990. He retires. What does he retire to? He retires to take up the officiating uh, head of NFL Europe. So he's in a working retirement. He's training and he's, uh, he's, he's an assistant in the office. He works well up to, through his 80s and into his 90s. And, and now he's in a true retirement. But basically, you have somebody who's worked in the NFL behind the scenes so all the things that you you don't notice happen because it was handled behind the scenes and nobody's taking credit for this or anything like that but he worked for the league for more than half of its history and i can't see how somebody could not be labeled a contributor to football when he was instrumental in all the rules changes through that time working with how the idea that officials look at game film was a thing that he created. It seems so basic, but it's, it's what, it, you know, they needed to look at that and say, okay, I saw this way on the field, but this is what I see now from, from the game film, all sorts of things with evaluations, making sure the grades are handled in an equitable way, because just because it's the conference championship game, missed pass interference. If you missed, 12 on the field earlier in the game, you almost say that that's the, the bigger call, not to the fans, but to the officials, that's a bigger call. So, you know, you've got to put weight to these calls and not determine on, 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 on whether or not it's controversial or not. He put in a grading system that says, Hey, you miss any of these calls, you miss a false start. You're going to be dinged just as much on that call. And he was very instrumental. And, you know, as far as I know, he keeps making it into, you know, into the final cut with the contrib uh, with the contributors committee uh, at the Hall of Fame, but he's just never made it over that hump. And I know that you know you don't have a game without you know Jerry Jones and you know anything by Ed DeBartolo and all the people that are up in the uh, upper echelons of the NFL. Um, but that's the thing is that you have teams that are advocating for that, you know. Uh, for for their uh, owner to get in, you have you know any any kind of partisan interest. Who's the partisan interest for officials? There's nobody. So we said, you know what, we really need to take this up and mention this. And it's a great disparity when you have other halls of fame with more than ten officials in, and the NFL just or, or the Pro Football Hall of Fame just hasn't even put one in. So. Each year we advance another four candidates so that they have something to, to look at. Um, and hopefully they, they kind of reference our material. 
But uh, yeah, I, I'm a big uh, supporter of, of Art McNally being the first. If, if anybody gets in first, it would be Art McNally. I mean, he has transformed the game in ways that people just don't even see and just did it totally behind the scenes. Just because it's it's part of the furniture doesn't mean that it wasn't that gra- it wasn't groundbreaking, and it was. And uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, I guess you can kind of feed off some of my passion that I have uh, for this. But yeah, I, I think the time has come that you know they they really need to start to catch up with the other halls of fame. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you who was going to be your Mount Rushmore. We'll call it McNally or George Washington. Do you have three other names that spring in your head right away? Yeah, we, we've so far nominated um, nine total, so Mark McNally was the first one that we, we threw down. Um, I definitely would like to see a Jim Tunney, who was a referee uh, for, for 31 years. Um, I'd like to see him in there. Jerry, Mark Bright, everybody knows. But again, you know what, we wind up, we do have a pro white hat bias. We wind up going with the referee because that's the one we have visibility to. So now... You know, and this is getting into the weeds for for the officiating geeks, but there's like a, you know, a back judge, Stan Javi, who was like, he knew the rule book. He could cite everything from memory. Uh, Jerry Bergman, uh, who uh, his two sons are are in the NFL now, uh, but he he had a, a string of Super Bowls. Ron Botch and Tom Kelleher, Bob Beeks, uh, Burl Toller, who broke the officiating color barrier for all pro sports. Um, You know, these are the names that, you know, you don't hear too often, but, you know, when sometimes you see some of these uh, announcements come out and some obscure lineman pops in, you're like, who's that? Unless you were a fan of the team, you don't know who that is, but they're deserving to be in there. So why is it that there's not some, uh, you know, a, a headlinesman, that worked for 30 years, why is he not in the Hall of Fame? You know, just because you haven't heard of him or just because you don't think he worked hard? Um, The fact that you didn't see him is even more a testament to the fact that he did his job and did his job well, in my opinion. Yeah, especially uh, the the guys that if they're never seen, they're not the ones that are in the controversial calls because they made the right call. Well, I mean, that's not fair to say that they, because they made the right call, I should rephrase that. But um, so speaking of making the calls and I know that technology continues to advance, you talked about the instant replay. That's one that everybody goes to. Are there any other technology advancements or rule changes coming forward in the future that you see or that you'd like to see? Well, one of the things you you have seen uh, a kind of a push, and and when we had uh, the Alliance League and and the XFL come through uh, with some of their innovations, you did see what was termed a sky judge on in, in one situation, but just basically somebody that is an extra set of eyes from from uh, you know the press box level, and I, I still have mixed feelings on that because. The reason it existed in these in these uh, spring leagues is you're bringing up college officials. It's not entirely the NFL rule book because they have all these little extra wrinkles in there. So I think you did need to have that extra person up there, a game supervisor or whatever, to just kind of be the bug in the ear and say, hey, you know what? You're going to have to call this this way. Or, you know what? You got two seconds left on the clock. Um, and, and we even saw that in the XFL where – you know, they even despite the fact that they had that that person up in the booth, they didn't buzz down and, and tell them you need to put two seconds back on the clock. So even adding that eighth official, or in the case of the XFL, ninth official, it didn't work. You know, so that's the question: is what's the incremental? Uh, you know, what do we gain from it? Uh, and in cases, you know, we we just have to see. You know, is looking at something once on video going to be sufficient? Because if you start letting them look at replays, now you're into a replay official. Now you're affecting the whole replay dynamic. So I'm still kind of mixed on on what a a sky judge or anything like that can offer to the NFL. Uh, We hear all sorts of other things about using lasers to spot the ball, uh, determine forward progress. measure first downs, uh, rule on field goals. And it just seems like it's a little bit much for uh, too much for anything. 
Um, you know, people will be surprised if they actually paid attention to how first downs are, are handled. It's really, yes, you do see the sticks on the sidelines, but if the ball is, is six inches behind the yard stripe, that ball is going to get spotted right with the nose on that yard stripe because then you know 10 yards later you've got a first down just by looking at it. Now, did they earn that six yards? No. Does it make a big difference? No, not at all. Nobody recognizes it until you actually point it out and say, hey, you know what? The nose of the ball wasn't touching the paint. And, you know, the, one of the situations that came up uh, recently was when you had referee Gene Steratore use a, an index card to try and determine whether or not the ball made it to the to the post on, on a first down. And I've seen that happen before, but I just never have seen it to this level. I was able to determine before he inserted that index card that it was a first down because I could see the line on the field. And I'm like, if the guy did his job the right way when they uh, started the series and put it on a stripe, the fact that it's just barely touching that stripe, it's a first down. So there's all these extra added things as well. You know, maybe we need to replay a field goal because – uh, you know, it looks like it was, you know, it was inside the post and he ruled it no good. And I'm thinking, you got a guy, he's looking right up the post. You don't have anybody with any better vantage point. If you see the ball, it's out. If you don't see the ball, it's in. So, you know, that, that's one of the things that, you know, we're starting to overcomplicate things with um, officiating as far as, you know, oh, we need to do all these technological things. And I just think that it's overkill. The one thing I, I have been in support of is, you know, they have all this next gen technology and I think it would just be a good idea if the replay official or somebody up in the booth just gets in somebody's ear and say, Hey, you know, they still have 12 on offense. Just so, you know, they still have to do their hard count before the snap, but, you know, at least have a, a backup where you have another way of, of counting that other than just counting heads. You know, especially when 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 there's a, a change in in uh, in personnel, or they do a fake platoon change where you have a, a punting team out, and then while the game, play clock is running, they switch it to you know to a fourth fourth down run. Um, you know, they need some backup in these particular situations, or any of these little funny things where uh, where a player calls in eligible uh, reports eligible. And so then they're in for that down. But if they stay in, you know, somebody's got to be in there and say, hey, you still have 80, you, you know, you, you still have um, 67. He's still an eligible receiver. He hasn't come out of the game. All these things just to help them uh, as they go along. And they do have help at the sideline. When, when you're getting down to the two-minute warning, you have the guy that's holding the chains. He's counting down to the two-minute warning so that the, uh, you know, the head linesman or, or down judge or the line judge is going to know if the snap came off before two minutes or before the expiration of, of, uh, of the period. So, you know, there, there's all these little helpers out there anyway, um, you know, and, and adding lasers and all, all sorts of things like that just seems to be overkill in my opinion. Yeah. It just kind of makes me think of, I'm, I'm watching this one documentary about the, the men that built America and it was on the history channel, but now it's Amazon prime and thinking about stuff that happened back then that seemed so revolutionary, but now was just like, well, yeah, that's just, I mean, that's old school kind of tactics. Uh, I'm going to give you a different kind of scenario. We're not going to go forward. I'm going to give you the keys to my DeLorean. You're going to go back in time, any point in time in NFL history, but because you're officiating, I'm going to give you a caveat. You got to talk to a somehow somebody that's involved in officiating. You can talk to one person and ask them one question. Who is it? What question are you asking? Well, that is very, very deep. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll be honest, I've never devoted much thought to that, but it certainly would be good to get back into the mindset of the original game and you know before tv is involved uh and and how how that evolved you know just the basic mechanics of of handling a game how do you how do you handle that and and i'm i'm kind of you know in in that time travel fantasy i'm almost 
uh, want to take that person from, from the 1940s, 1950s game and say, Hey, let me show you this and see what you think about this. And, and it would be totally foreign to them. Um, but as far as asking, you know, I, one of the things is, is that, you know, 1940s, 1950s, you know, they're, they're officiating games. They're just seen by the people that are in the stands and all that. Um, but the question is, is, you know, how do you, where, where do they see the game going at that particular time? Uh, what do they think is where, where the future of, the, of officiating is? Uh, because, you know, that right after uh, the greatest game ever played, football just wound up taking over baseball as, as the game. And now we can watch every game on, on Sunday from, from our living room and, and how much that has changed. Yeah. So I, I would be really interested to know, you know, some of these, you know, like uh, uh, a referee, like Ron Gibbs of the 1940s, who's like in every championship game, like 12 straight championship games, you know, where do you see this game going? Because you are officiating this game for the people that are there, uh, the people in the crowd and the guys that are writing. And unfortunately it was just men at that particular time who are writing that everybody's going to read this account of the game. And uh, so I, I guess that was without having anything really spectacular um, <laughs> to, uh, to ask them that that would be something I'd be interested in. I think it'd be cool to bring someone forward too. And I mean, you mentioned they can watch any game from their living room. I could go, I could bring Jim Thorpe here and say, here, go, go take a dump and you can use my phone and you can watch whatever game you want. That's <laughs> how much it's changed since back in the day. Well, any rate, uh, Ben, crazy amount of information that we've had here, footballzebra.com. I know you have a lot of other links and stuff that we'll put in the show notes, including your book. Anything else, any last words of wisdom you want to give to the fans of the show? Well, I just uh, want to let everybody know, and we do this with our coverage. Any Sunday or any game that that kicks off, there's three teams on the field, and you know, as much as each team works together, uh, you know, there there's actually a game plan by the third team there, and um, you know, and I don't expect you to like them. I don't expect you to agree with them, but. Um, you know, just to have a, a general appreciation of them, uh, much as we did after the, the 2012 lockout, you know, there was a lot of love for officials. It wore off after about a week or so, but that that's kind of returning to uh, status quo, I guess. But uh, I mean, I guess that's my overwhelming uh, message is, you know, there's a team out there that prepares just as hard uh, as the other two. There you go. Remember that there's a third team out there also on Sundays. Well, I mean, Thursdays, Mondays, Saturdays, sometimes too, I guess, but whatever. Each game, not just the home and away team. There's a third team, the officials, and they're the ones that help keep the game in order. And speaking of Sundays, the book giveaway for Ben's book ends during this week's game between the Dallas Cowboys and the Los Angeles Rams. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make a, a, what you call a prediction. I'm going to take the Cowboys defeating the Rams 34 to 33 with a final crazy, I don't know, maybe overtime game even thing. Ah, just right at the very end. It can't be overtime. It's 34 to 33. But hey, we're going to call it at the very end of the game some wild, crazy play. Don't ask me how they get the 33 score, though. I don't know. And to sign up for the book again, remember, go to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. And while you're over there, don't forget to sign up for the email newsletter because you definitely want to listen to next week's episode. We have a special NFL 100th birthday episode in store for you. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. 
Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.